All right, Loretta, welcome. Thank you for jumping on. Um, can you just sort of introduce yourself to the uh, viewers for me? Hi, my name is Loretta Joseph. Um, I am Australian, obviously. Uh, for the, I used to be an investment banker in my past life and a derivatives trader, which I did um, since 1991. I've traded most asset classes around the world. I discovered blockchain, I think, in 2012. Um, I just finished, I, I ran a bank in India. I was the managing director of RBS. So I just discovered blockchain. And I'd had a bad experience with one of my domestic help. Um, her little girl had to go to work when she was 13 and she went to work in a bangle factory and she got raped and murdered by 19 guys on her first day at work. And I had to pay wow. to have this kid buried. And there was no way to identify her. So she didn't die with, with dignity, she, she wasn't born with it. So I remember this was like in 2010, I was thinking, God, there's gotta be some sort of system with you know, where we are in the world that these things don't happen anymore. So it was just fortuitous. And then I discovered blockchain. Um, I didn't really look at it from the crypto side. I, I built a clearing settlement system for an exchange in Australia called the Sydney Stock Exchange, because my biggest bugbear as an asset trader um, was, was clearing settlement times. They're a nightmare across all, you know, all different assets set classes at their different times, clearing settlements are really painful, lots of friction in the systems. Um, and then, so I did that. I looked at the Australian law and it wasn't technology agnostic. So I told um, the finance ministry that they had to fix that. And they did. Um, I think there's more good luck than good management. And then um, I, I discovered Bitcoin probably in 2000. And 12, I started to look at it seriously. And I was thinking, oh God, these guys are very unorganized. You know, I was a compliant banker for a number of years. So I worked with ADCA, with the Australian Digital Chamber of Commerce. Um, we did a lot of work with the government around having a definition of what the hell, what Bitcoin was, a digital asset. Um, we had a lot of the, the taxes taken off. And then the, the rest was history. Um, the self-regulation of Bitcoin went very well. I went to Davos in 2016, where I met the Premier of Bermuda. Um, which was quite interesting because I didn't know where Bermuda was at the time. And I'd spoken at an MIT event and he said to me, can you come to, to Bermuda tomorrow and write my legislation for digital assets? And I was like, well, A, I'm not a lawyer and B, I don't know where, where Bermuda is. And C, I've got a child that lives on her own in Australia. He convinced me and the rest is history. So we wrote the first legislation around digital assets in Bermuda in 2017. Um, we did the first bill around initial coin offerings. Um, which took a lot of the scamming around that. And then I seem to become some sort of regulatory um, expert on this stuff. And so I now deal with you know, lots of organisations like the OECD, the OSCE, um, the FATF, all these things that I probably never would have had anything to do with. I've written a lot of regulation around the world. I'm in the process of writing a lot of legislation around the world and I've done that. So that's me. I tend to fly off to islands. I like islands. They're very nimble. They're very quick and they all want to be innovative. So I'm quite good at, um, yeah, if you're an island state, call me because I'll quite possibly come and I may not leave. So that's how I ended up. I'm in Mauritius at the moment. Um, I'm in lockdown, but other than that, yeah, that's the story of me. So yeah. I guess I, I'm sort of a policy influencer, I guess, around digital assets and making sure that um, we don't ban this stuff and we have sensible regulations around the world. Yeah, very interesting. Look, um, would you mind talking a little bit about your your previous career as a derivatives trader? Sort of oh, how, you, how you got into so that and, and, uh, and yeah, I guess maybe how that sort of influenced you into sort of moving into the blockchain sort of space? Yeah, so I, I left uni in, oh, it makes me old, what am I, 52? But 1991, I got my first job as a futures trader on the futures floor. I remember walking onto the futures floor and I got handed a piece of paper and a pencil and I got thrown into the uh, the, the bank wheel option pit. And I didn't know what a bank wheel was or an option. Um, I put my hand up against something and oh, they, we used to stand in pits that had funny jackets on and we'd use our hands as hand signals. They're very funny days. Um, and then I obviously did the trade, but I didn't really understand what I did. So I went downstairs to the bathroom, sat in the loo for half an hour, tried to figure out what I'd done, went back upstairs. And that was that, that was my introduction to futures trading. I did that for, for a number of years. Um, and in those days, we didn't have computers. We didn't have phones, we didn't have computers. We had telephones and pieces of paper. So I was under the DeFi guys now. If she can show me, if you can do your times tables, I'd be really impressed because you all can't add up in your heads without a calculator. <laughs> um, so I did that for a number of years, yeah. So yeah, I traded fixed income options. I traded fixed income um, commodities um, in, out of Australia. We used to do frozen orange juice on you know, the CME. We were the night desk for a lot of the US market markets. So that was my career for oh, a good 20 years. And then um, 
Yes, so it was, yeah, we had, I did that for a good 20 years. Then I went off to India with my little girl as a single mum in 2006. I set up a derivatives desk for Macquarie Bank and then I went on to be the managing director of RBS. By which stage, I think I was 42, 43, and I decided I'd had enough of all of that business. So I tried to retire and then I discovered blockchain. <laughs> okay. And how did, um, I guess, you know, going from a derivatives, derivatives trader um, into the blockchain space, how was that sort of transition for yourself? So what, I mean, I look at it because I was, yeah, I've traded asset classes. So when I looked at what yeah, Bitcoin itself was and inherently what other assets, yeah, Bitcoin is the digitalization of money. So, and I looked at what ICOs were doing. Um, it's just another asset class. I mean, everybody thinks that these things are new and interesting. It's like, you know, once you trade one asset class, you can easily trade another asset class. Um, so I just, I looked at it from that angle that these things are just, you know, new new instruments. Um, I came up with the idea that digital assets were the bigger class because now with blockchain, um, Bitcoin, of course, was the first um, application of blockchain, but certainly not the last. But what did Bitcoin do? It digitalized money. Now, everybody's got a different view of what money is. Money actually comes out of barter. Thousands of years ago, we used to barter with, you know, stone, with food. Then they had stones. Some people had shells. Um, for some reason, we moved into pieces of paper with people's heads you know, stamped on it, fair currency. Um, but, barter, but money comes out of a barter system. And I think that's one thing um, Bitcoin did for the world, other than pro, pro, yeah, provide a very hard and security layer on top of the internet. So a peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value, which we all use, but it's not secure. So now we have a peer-to-peer -peer tra um, peer -peer transfer of money. So I just, I looked at it and, and the space, is very yeah very new new I mean a bit Satoshi Nakamoto only discovered Bitcoin in two thousand and eight nine and I'd worked through the GFC so another way I looked at it was like oh my god why did we have the GFC because Lehman Brothers would were 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 deliver, having bonds delivered to them before they paid for them that's a process we call in central banking and in financial markets is DBP and I thought I remember going into the, bank, the central bank governor of Canada with a bunch of you know, Bitcoin protocol developers who were very grubby and, and I thought he was going to have a heart attack. And they were talking about, you know, Bitcoin and coding and the libertarianism. And I mean, he almost, his eyes rolled back in his head. And then I said, okay, just everyone stop for a sec. And I said, Governor, what's your biggest problem? And he said, well, financial stability. That's what we do as central banks. So I said, yeah, it's a big one um, and you need to keep banks afloat. And I, so I said to the Bitcoin guys, do you understand the concept of DVP, delivery versus payment? And of course they didn't. And I said, but this is the, the one feature that we can do across all asset classes now, we can atomically swap them. Because when you trade a Bitcoin, it goes from one person to other, there's no intermediary, there's no post-trading um, post um, you know, problems, there's no you know, credit risk, default risk, all those things are taken out. So in fact, what Bitcoin did for money, it, it actually has a huge real world purpose for things like you know, for central banks, when, you, when you're seeing financial um, instability and and banks started starting to go under. So that was an interesting conversation, and it, it showed me that the Bitcoin dudes were talking one language, and the central bank guys and the governments were talking another, and there was nobody that they could cross reference. So I took it upon myself then to be the interpreter, if you wish, about how these yeah, how these two worlds can meet, um, where that where there's collaboration, um, because there is, and I think. Then I discovered, I thought, I don't know much about this system. So I rang Bob Khan. Now, Robert Khan sent the first message across an open network to a man called Vince Cert. So he's the father of the internet. And I rang him up and I said, hello, Bob, I'm Loretta from Australia. I don't understand how the internet works. Could you teach me? Um, he thought I was a very strange person, but he didn't hang up. But then I spent the next seven years understanding what, what protocols were and what, how open systems were created. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a very big... Um, yeah, it was a big learning curve for me because I, I didn't know how to code. So I had to teach myself to code at 43. But I understood there was a, a huge connection between um, how asset, asset classes trade and this new financial system and the old one. So, you know, it, it's been an interesting journey. I didn't mean to do it by um, choice. I sort of just put in this role by default. So then, you know, I started to get a lot of coins and, and big coins and my, my problem was with the ecosystem, they're very naughty because they borrowed terms from financial systems. Like Bitcoin, if we had called it Zen token, no central bank in the world would be worried about it. Now, initial coin offerings, had we called them initial business offerings, or digital crowdfund, nobody would have gone off and they would have been regulated. Um, cryptocurrencies exchanges, they're not exchanges. Like, yeah, they're not the NASDAQ or 
um, you know, the ASX, their marketplaces where they, they they just match buyers and sellers. So they borrowed all these terms from the old world. It's all the old old world got very upset and very confused and thinking, oh, we're going, you know, we're going to lose our roles. And I'm like, look, after the internet came along, yeah, you know, we probably saw the democratization of media, and that's impacted everything we do. And I think um, Bitcoin has certainly democratized money in the form of what money is, not in the form of what fair currency is. So yeah, that's where we sit today. But so I, there's a, there's a lot of friction um, about terminology, and yeah, in Australia we actually called them digital assets, and cryptocurrency is a subset of that. Yeah, the FATF refer to everything as virtual assets, and I'm like, well, they're not virtual because they exist. Like we all need to have one definition. So yeah, it's the US guys are calling them crypto assets, and I don't know, the Slovenians are calling them. But it, there are so many different definitions, and everybody's talking about the same thing. So no one's on the page. So that's been my, my, I guess, for the last five years has been my mission to ensure that we're on the same page because the internet taught Bob and he taught me that the siloed approach to technology and regulation does not work. Yeah. So that, yeah, so that's, that's what I do. Okay. And look, so just, just backtracking a little bit because you kind of covered a lot there, um, but you were talking about DVP, um, so delivery versus payment. Can you talk to me a little bit about, I guess, what that is for the viewers and then I guess... Um, how blockchain has sort of helped make that uh, process a bit more efficient. So, so DVP is what we call delivery versus payment. So all bond traders, fixed income, um, we trade bonds every day. The financial system revolves around you know, um, people trading bonds and the, the, the systemic risk is, is between the, the, the bank level, but the central bank sits above all the banks. And if anyone goes under, they have to come in because they're what we call the lender of last resort. So if everything goes pear shaped, you can always go to the central bank. So central banks control monetary policy and fiscal policy, also financial stability. Now, DVP has been a concept which has been around for many years in the financial markets, but it's it has never found or there's never been a technology which could make that instantaneous. So yeah, delivery, delivering a bond and waiting two days for it and not being paid for it, it can create systemic risk. And that happens across a lot of assets. Like, yeah, you can all the post-trade risks that are associated, like credit risk, default risk, um, there's so many risks that are in post-trade. So what does Bitcoin do? It atomically swaps an asset between two parties. So um, so that's what I, you know, I'm really interested in because once you can do that, you take out a lot of the risks that are associated with the post-trade processes. Um, and when I looked at ICOs, why, why did initial coin offerings take off? Same process. So you, you trade a coin in the primary market, but in normal markets, security markets, there's regulation that says that you can't sell out of that um, into another market. You have to wait a certain amount of time. But the, the crypto guy has been you know, innovative as they are. Went, well, guess what? We'll just raise our own money in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and Ethereum. And we're not gonna worry about this first and secondary market stuff. If you, you get a, a coin in the first market, you can go and sell it in the next two minutes. You, know, you bought it for 10 cents. You can now go and sell it for $4 in the secondary market. So there was a lot of scams. Um, that space really did need to be regulated because there was, and, and regulators didn't know how to regulate it because it's not like regulating you know, a security because you don't get an equity stake um, like a bond and yeah, so many problems for regulators because they didn't understand the technology. Um, but the technology can actually solve a lot of these predetermined risks that we've had in financial markets and asset classes for as long as history is because the technology can do that. So it disintermediates markets, but the technology itself is also very useful to make um, financial markets and more efficient. So efficient, secure and immutable which is what the blockchain is or the database, is very relevant in you know, not only financial markets, but across every, every industry sector. Okay. And so you also, you also mentioned um, that you were actually learning about the internet from one of the, uh, the fathers of the internet, so uh, Bob Kahn. Can you talk to me a little bit about that experience yep. um, and obviously learning to code and stuff at, at 43 oh. um, as well? Yeah, so that so I, as I said, I just found I wrote who googled who built the internet, Bob Kahn and Vincent came up. So I thought, and I'm I'm quite industrious. So I don't know how I got his phone number, but I did. So yeah, so I called Bob and I said, Bob, I don't understand any of this. And and I'd gone, I was going to a conference I think in Washington um, on blockchain. So I arranged to meet him, and I met him and his lovely wife Patrice. And Patrice is a lawyer. She's a professor of law at Princeton. 
And it occurred to me when I was sitting with him the first time that, because Bob's an electrical engineer, yeah, he said across an open network something and said hello to a man called Vint Cert. Now that was the creation of the TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol and the Internet Protocol. Now, none of us know that there's, you know, there's 48 new protocols on top of that first one. Nobody cares, you know, you just use your mobile device. So it's a bit sad, really. Yeah, look, not many people know um, the impact that people like Robert Carter had on us. I mean, he, I, I, it was funny yesterday, he sent me an email. He said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Are you and Patrice okay? And, he, and I said, Bob, I'm just going to say a big thank you from the entire world because none of us would have survived the pandemic for the last year without what you created. Yeah, that's um, so true. And he, he was quite... It's like, yeah, nobody would have ever thought to say thank you. So I, I, I worked out very quickly without Patrice because she wrote all the regulations around what the internet was. So when Bob first built the internet, people wanted to, um, you know, he said the first 10 years, the government's in the bank side, we shut it down. He's like, you can't do that, open network. Then he said the next 10 years, everyone's like, we want to buy it. He's like, you can't do that either, it's open. So open source systems and, and, and how they work, um, I became very interested in, and I've read, he's taught me a hell of a lot about electrical engineering. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of pages about unique identifiers. I'm not a mathematician or an electrical engineer. I certainly don't get excited by that side of it, but I've sat through it. Um, but he did also teach me that the one thing that they didn't embed when he built the, the, the IP, the internet protocol, was security. So we, we, we can now democratise media and send all that stuff over, but the internet's not secure. So I learned that very quickly. And then I, I, then I figured out once I started to code, um, yeah, uh, in in just yeah you know, Python and some other stuff, and I looked at blockchain coding. I was thinking, so what Bitcoin offered was was not only a peer to peer electronic cash system, it also offered a new security layer to the internet that we'd never seen before. And I think from an infrastructure play, that is much more important than what Bitcoin does because we can now transfer value across the network securely. And people tell me that the quantum computer dudes will figure out how to do that. I'm like, yeah, right. Um, but you know, but I think these protocols are starting to harden. And yeah, cryptocurrency, you've got Litecoin, you've got Bitcoin, you've got the Ethereum blockchain. They're all very different. I think as we start to mature, these these protocols need to yeah, it's a lot of men, a lot of young kids in this space, and they've got a lot of ego. They've got to understand that they really need to solve the problems of inter, um, interoperability, scalability, because if one wins, everybody wins. So I think what we will see over the next 10 years is um, the scams, you know, the cryptocurrencies that don't really do anything will go, but you will see the likes of, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe Polkadot, all come together to make this new security layer, which will be just an infrastructure. None of us care how our mobiles work. Nobody cares how the internet works. It's just an infrastructure. And I think that's what you're seeing now, um, is you're just seeing this, this back level of infrastructure that is so secure and has so many different use cases being created. Yeah, I totally agree. Look, you also mentioned um, as well about, you were talking a little bit about um, the ICO boom um, and the problems surrounded or that surrounded that, I guess. Can you sort of go into, um, you know, what was sort of going on there? And then I guess how you've sort of, you know, tried to um, come up with some kind of regulation to, you know, stamp that sort of stuff out. Yeah, so, so that was what we did. Other than like the Digital Asset Business Act in Bermuda, we looked at ICOs. Now, as I said, I was an equity trader. I was a bond trader. Like I've always traded asset classes and regulators couldn't understand what an ICO was. And I said, the language is a bit naughty. Had we recorded initial, you know, initial digital business offerings, nobody probably would have cared. But what you saw out of that was, I said, the immediate transaction from a primary market into a secondary market. So there were people scamming people left, right and centre. Regulators couldn't get their heads around um, these ICOs because generally when, when you do an investment or you, know, um, you raise money, you get equity. Now, in an ICO, you don't get equity in the project. You just get the ability to use the goods or services in a network. And how I explain it to regulators is it, it's a bit like having Emirates points. So I fly Emirates all the time. You know, I've got gazillions of points. Well, I haven't flown anywhere for a while, so I don't have that many now. But, you know, what can I do with those points? Either upgrade my flight or buy a bar fridge you know, or, or six wine glasses, whatever you get. But you can't use that you know, Emirates token outside it. So it's very much like a loyalty program. And regulators couldn't understand why there was no equity swap. And I said, so you, you've got to be very careful when you're looking at these things. What makes something a security? Um, and it's security, you do an investment to make money, so to raise. Um, but there's no equity transfer in an ICO. You just get, you get the token. 
So I looked at what a lot of these these guys were doing, and a lot of the ICOs would, were, yeah, were a lot of scamming people, scamming people. Consumers and investors were getting getting hurt. Um, regulators didn't understand what they were, so they were finding it very hard to regulate. So, um, yeah. So looking at what we did in, in Bermuda, I was like, all right. So what are these things? They're either the ability to buy a token which you can use in that network only, or you're buying that token to see if there's if you invest in that the price is going to go up. If you're doing that, guess what? You're going to be a security. Um, but and, but what happens if you actually you're a utility and you go and um, think you're going to build Google 19? So you raise all this money. It takes you 10 years to get there, but you actually become the next Google. So. It, there's three, so I guess it, it's it's the ability of a of a token to be a utility to do something really cool for the world. Um, a lot of them are securities because they just want to raise money and don't do much after that. And there's hybrids, so that's what we came up with. We said, you know, um, you can be you can be one or the other, or you can be a mix of both. But how do you stop the scams? Um, and what's the thing that jurisdictions are worried about? It was beneficial ownership because I could do an ICO, go and put a, something a website up, going. Yes. Okay. I'm going to raise money, and I'm going to build, you know, the, the coolest healthcare um, yeah, protocol that's ever been. Or you, know, you look at Doge, which actually did well, like Doge I'm going to go and do a coin that's got a dog in the head of it, um, and yeah, and then people would just disappear with this money. So everybody was getting was consumers, investors were getting upset, and the first thing they do is they go to a government or a regulator. But when something's not regulated, it's very hard to do that. So um, so well, I've looked at it very carefully, and I said. The one way that you stop the nefarious actors and what we did in Bermuda, a lot of people didn't like me for this, but we gave civil and, and criminal penalties. So we said, if you're going to do a capital raise, you can come to Bermuda or Mauritius, we're going to do it, but you have to set the company up under the law. You, the directors have to sit on the jurisdiction. And if anything goes wrong, you're liable for criminal penalties. So you go to jail, which is all right if you can look out at the water, but still you're in jail. Um, or you get security penalties of like $10 million. So that really that really got rid of the crap and people started to do these things um, yeah, for proper reasons. Because there's, there's a huge, um, yeah, the, ICO, the ICO showed me one thing. So there's the ecosystem, we're trying to raise money and you know, you've got a bunch of 20 year olds running around saying they're gonna build these, you know, these cool protocols. Who are they getting money from? Either their friends or their family. No bank wanted to touch them. No venture capital wanted uh, company wanted to touch them. So they went, all right, we'll just do it our own way. We'll go and raise money and we'll do it in uh, Ether or Bitcoin. And then they, the rest of the world, can, we don't give a toss. So that was an incredibly ingenious and innovative way to, to do digital crowd funds. But like everything, you know, nefarious players come in and, and people always do the wrong thing. So there, has to, there had to be a regulation um, that sort of covered off the consumer and investor protection, but also doesn't stifle innovation. And I always say to people, you know, it's very hard because regulators are not technologists and technologists are not regulators and they don't speak the same language. But there has to be, you know, there has to be rules and regulations that stop people being scammed. And consumers, investors, you know, that's why regulation exists, to stop the FATF, which is Financial Action Task Force. They cover money laundering and terrorism financing. None of us want... You know, kids to be trafficked or people to blow each other up. So that they're there for a reason. Under that, you have securities regulators who, who are there to protect the consumer and an investor. Now, we can't stop anyone using technology. My 17-year-old uh, yeah, never lets go of the phone out of her left hand in her waking hours. Um, I can't stop her doing that. But what I can stop is I can say, buy, beware. If you go into these things, do it at your own risk. Um, and because I was an asset trader, I'm going, no, asset goes one way forever. I mean, yeah, the Bitcoin guys go, Bitcoin's to the moon. I'm like, oh. yeah, things go up and down. This is just the law of, of how markets work. Nothing goes one way. So you have to just make sure that there's a, yeah, the, the, the buyer beware. If you get into this, it's risky. It's highly volatile and you might lose every cent you put in. So only invest as much money as you're prepared to lose. And I think that's the message that I got through um, with the regulations and with most regulators, like let's do it like that. Because when you start to try and regulate technology, that's a very stupid thing to do. And it doesn't work. People just go and do it outside. You mentioned the FATF as well. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about who these people are? Um, and then I guess, can you sort of explain a little bit about their understanding of digital assets and I guess how well they sort of understand the space as well? So the, the FATF stands for the Financial Action Task Force. So they're the standard setter and the body which 
um, monitors things like money laundering, terrorism financing, and they can they blacklist countries that are doing those things. So under a blacklist of the FATF, you've got, um, say, North Korea and Iran. They're the ones that are, that are sanctioned. But they can close economies. I mean, they're, 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 they're the big kahuna of regulators because security regulators sit under them. But the, the FATF makes standards and, um, yeah, and, and rules that say countries cannot do this you know, in, in, you know, for, the, for, for the aid of terrorism, for terrorism financing or money laundering. So they're the big kahuna. So Rick McDonald, who's a very good friend of mine, he's Australian actually, he set up the um, FATF in 2007. So it's the G20. It's effectively the G7 and the G20. And there's a whole rule, yeah, you know, there's recommendations um, that say, you know, this is the this is the, the steps each country must do to mitigate the risks of money laundering and terrorism financing. They called digital assets virtual assets back in 2011 because they 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 saw that, that there was nefarious activities around things like Bitcoin and and, and bad players. Yeah, you know, bad players use technology all the time. I mean, have we listened to what they were saying about the internet that, that the internet was only good going to be good for gambling and porn? How wrong we were. Um, so I wish they had have called virtual assets, which I say is a subcategory of a digital asset, um, a, a digital asset. So they they've come up with a number of guidelines. Um, they've been very worried about yeah you know, people using Bitcoin. Mainly Bitcoin, um, the, so the privacy coins, how this interacts with bad players, nefarious players entering the systems and then getting their, their, their cryptocurrency into the financial system. Um, now, they've been very worried about that recently, but if you look at what the blockchain space itself does, um, Bitcoin is not anonymous. It's what we call pseudo anonymous. So we can track and trace every single Bitcoin that moves around the world. So I always say to law enforcement and, and you know, these guys, like, this is such a better tool than cash because anybody can use cash. You and I can swap cash. You can never track and trace it. Um, and that comes down to the beneficial ownership and stuff. And you see the Bitcoin, guess what? You know who owns it. So they've been using the technology to, I guess, enhance their, um, you know, their, their ability to track and trace that thing. But at the beginning, all the ecosystem was really scared of the FATF because you know, kids that are entrepreneurs building businesses, the last thing they were thinking about is money laundering or terrorism financing. But you know they're very important things in the world, and we do we do need to have regulations to stop things like that. But we also need, um, yeah, we we need um, countries not to be concerned that if they go into this space, then the FATF is going to blacklist them. So it's a double-edged sword. So um, you know the, the ecosystem and the FATF have been now working together for a while. Um, they came out with recommendation 15, I think, last year that said, what well, happens in the banking world? You need to know um, the sender. The, who the sender is of the cryptocurrency at the exchange and who's the receiver. So that's something that's called the travel rule. Everybody was up in arms about the travel rule. But again, the technologists figured it out. And, you know, so if Binance sends, you know, um, some crypto to somebody at Kraken or they send it to Coinbase, we can now, there's, there's, there is the ability to know who's behind that. And so that, that, that 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 has sort of taken, I think, some of the fear out. The FATF are working much closer with the industry, but you don't, well, as a country, you don't want to get on the FATF blacklist. Like that's that's not good. So they're the big Kahuna. So think about you have the big Kahuna of the FATF is the, the chief regulator. Then you have the second level, which is the securities regulator, the commodities regulators, and probably on that path, the prudential regulation regulators, which is um, bodies that regulate the banks. So usually the central bank. Okay. But they all have different crossover regulations, but you have to comply with some of this stuff, even if you're in digital assets, because it matters. And I think the ecosystem, was like, we don't worry about that. I was like, well, at the end of the day, do we want to see kids traffic? Do we want to see, um, you know, pornography rings? Do we want to see terror? No, none of us want that. So if we all work together with that big goal, as not these people are just trying to over-regulate you because that's what they want to do, then that's the collaboration piece. And we can actually work effectively together as policy regula uh, regulators, policy, and the industry to ensure that these things actually stop. Yeah. Look, you also um, mentioned about uh, digital asset marketplaces, um, which most people in the crypto space would probably uh, refer to as uh, a crypto exchange. Um, are yes. you working on regulation um, in regards to that as well? And if so, can you sort of talk I a just, bit about that? I just penned my last word about two hours ago on that, if you wish. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I've, I've, worked, I've worked with security exchanges you know, most of my life. I've traded on, on, on exchanges where you trade this stuff. So um, 
what we as security exchanges, and this is where, again, the community was a bit naughty or a bit naive. They thought, oh, that sounds like a good thing. We'll say we're a cryptocurrency exchange and we look like we're sort of regulated and we're, yeah, we've got a bit of credibility. Yeah. So in on exchange, takes, for example, the ASX. So when you go and do a trade on the ASX, for that split second that the buyer and the seller come together, we call that novation. The exchange actually takes the risk of the buyer and seller. Crypto currencies exchanges ain't taking any risk. They're just matching buyers and sellers and they're going, oh, there you go, walk away. So they're not exchanges. They are, they're marketplaces that just match buyers and sellers. They're, 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 they're matching engines effectively. Um, but everybody, and everyone's been worried about, you know, cryptocurrency exchanges or digital asset marketplaces, whatever you want to call them for the time being, um, with no regulation. And all the big ones have been trying to find someone to re regulate them. And everyone's going, oh, you're too big and you're too scary. And, you know, you, you may be laundering money over here. Like, we can't touch you. So there's been a big quandrum, I guess, around the world is like, okay, somebody needs to regulate these guys. They want regulation um, and they need it. And because, of the, you know, they, they want to be bona fide. Um, businesses. My belief is in the next five years that cryptocurrency exchanges will just be regulated as we see normal exchanges, but from a different perspective. So also with a security exchange, you know, that's part of a country's infrastructure. You know, they're public-private partnerships. You've got to be very careful when you're treading on that sort of policy um, because, again, you can cause all sorts of issues for, for, for government. So they're, they're not exchanges per se. But they, they facilitate the trading or the you know, the matching engines of buyers and sellers, um, and yeah, the bigger the market gets now with what, you know, big or the yeah, you know, what's the market over one trillion dollars? They're not going away, and they're just going to go into more places, and and everybody's going down the, the route of the decentralized exchange. Oh God, I don't know how you're going to regulate that one. But at least at the moment, yeah, you know, if you got a Binance or a Kraken or a Coinbase there's some semblance of ability to make them do a, like the same things. So that's what I've been working on in Mauritius. I worked on the custody of digital assets for about two years because that kept me up at night because I had Bitcoin. And I was like, what happens to my daughter if I die tomorrow? How's she going to get my Bitcoin? But, but now, you know, the regulation of these things has taken me a good two years because you know, some, of the, some of the trading mechanisms that are done on exchanges are similar to security exchanges, but the technology is totally different. And yeah, you know, you know, do you want an exchange to hold everybody's crypto in a centralized database when it's, you know, blockchain is a decentralized database, but the exchanges put them all, all your, your crypto and your addresses in one database and they get hacked. So there's problems around that. You've got to make sure that the custody is right. Um, you know, they're, they're obviously atomically swapped assets. Like how do, you, how do you make sure that there's tax done in them, insurance, these issues. Like there's so many complicated pieces of, 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 of um, cryptocurrency exchanges, so much complicated pieces. And so, you know, I've thought about this for a number of years using what I know about security exchanges and, you know, um, market participation and all the things that IOSCO, which is the large group of regulators that, that regulate um, security exchanges, yeah, you know, market manipulation, front running orders, um, you know, all those things that you do in normal markets, you need to do in crypto markets. I'm sorry. You know, if you're front running orders for your market makers, no, no, that, yeah. So, and I think they need to be regulated now because once we get into the space of these decentralized exchanges like we're starting to see with DeFi, oh God, like, I don't know how I'm going to explain that to any regulator. I don't, I, I'm having a big trouble with DeFi and every, with all these bizarre projects that have food references. Like, they, they wonder why regulators don't take them seriously. Like, you know, regulators just look at me and say, yeah, what's the, well, yeah, what's the sushi one? And it's like, oh, yeah, the, the yam project. I'm like, oh, my God. So yeah, the, the, <laughs> the language and the ability of the understanding is, is still very, very slow in, in the education piece. But hopefully the um, regulation I've written, which I'm going to release in Mauritius again, like my custody regulation, will be taken as a template. And my biggest wish is that the Commonwealth, because Australia is part of the Commonwealth, Mauritius is, all the islands I've been, if I can give one, one template of legislation for all this stuff to every country in the world that's got common law, boom. There's 53 countries in the Commonwealth. The British gave us one thing in the common law system. The US can do whatever the world they're going to keep doing for 10 years and not get anywhere. The, um, the Europeans can keep fighting. And us as the Commonwealth can move companies between each country without with the ability of knowing that they're regulated properly, 
businesses can grow. You can go and access in India and Africa, knock yourself out because that's what you need if you're a tech company's customers. Um, we've mitigated the risks of money laundering, terrorism, financing, and the Commonwealth is great again. So that's my, that's my um, mission for the 27th of May when I stand up in front of all the Commonwealth heads of state and tell them this is what I think they should do. So we'll see how that's, how that's taken on board. But I, I do think um, having 53 countries with the same law system that we could just roll this out. Obviously, their law, legal systems are a bit different, but having a template that works across 53 countries is going to be much easier than me going into every single country and having to do this, because I'll be dead by the time I'd, I'm finished. Yeah, most definitely. Um, look, you mentioned DeFi as well. How have you explained that to regulators? How has that conversation gone down? Um, that, that goes down with a lot of open mouths and a lot of, and a lot of uh, eyes that go backwards. So D, I said, I said, about, so it's like having banking services. They do everything that a bank does, you know, lend, borrow, you know, um, asset management, exchange, everything. But guess what? There's no bank in the middle. It's between people. So that's, and they have these bizarre projects that are now raising, you know, lots and lots of money called, you know, with, with references to food. I don't know who thought of that. Like, who came up with the food <laughs> references? I don't know, but it makes my life very difficult. A, because regulators don't take it seriously. And you, you look at the size of the market cap and it's getting bigger every day. There's no regulation again. You know, you saw that that episode um, out of Sushi Swap when somebody moved all their tokens, their governance tokens, and yeah, and everybody ran away. There's no lender of last resort like a central bank to come in and say, no, no, you'll be covered. So. It's a very interesting, um, interesting place we see at the moment because what do regulators do generally? We regulate the intermediaries. So where the regular, you know, the regulators, are the banks or the non-financial players are regulated, but now you've got no regulators, no regulated entities to regulate. It's peer-to-peer -peer transfer. So it's going to be a really interesting journey. Um, look, the poor regulators, they're still back in the day of the ICOs. They've only just gotten over that. So yeah, explaining DeFi is, yeah, is is it's it's like explaining financial systems on the on Mars. So they but but we have to start looking at this stuff because when people start getting again, um, you know, scammed or consumers investors get ripped off, can the system can the system itself um, ensure that the governance models are strong enough that that doesn't happen? Ethereum, I, you know, you know, the problem I see with Ethereum is it's still not scalable and all this stuff's done on Ethereum. And we had the, the great example of the DAO. Okay, somebody wrote the code the wrong way and then they went, no, no, we'll just reverse it. So in my eyes, that's not decentralized. If, if Vitalik Buterin can go and reverse that, well, you can do it again in DeFi, how does it scale? Again, there's no interoperability between protocols. I really do like um, Polkadot at the moment. I think Gavin Wood, is doing an amazing job, and I think you will you will see in the next couple of years that protocol really start to be able to scale um, and and, you know, and support DeFi in in a way that we don't see at the moment. Because now I, I'm afraid that we're going to have another crypto kitties episode. <laughs> and my daughter had crypto kitties. Oh, trying to explain that to a regulator was was particularly difficult. I explained it as the sort of the Pokemon cats of the digital world. And when I said the regulator's going, well, what do we do? And I said, well, I don't know what you're going to do because what are you going to call in crypto kitty number four and you know, charging for violation of security law? Thank God that fell over with the network. But, you know, that, that was an interesting challenge as well, especially when our kids are using these things and they don't see that there's risk. Um, so I just think it will come down to the fact that regulators are going to say, all right, you do this, you do this at your own risk. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. If you're stupid enough to put all your money into it and you lose it, don't come to us. Um, but we will have to put some loose guidelines. And I think that will come from the community. I think that we are, with, with the way that we can, we can now make governance models interesting in protocols, I think we could actually build in regulation to the system. That's why I keep saying the FATF. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could have code, uh, regulation in code? And I think this is the next wave, is that we start to see code doing the, the job of the regulator. So, you know, so it's interesting times, non-fungible tokens, oh, good God. Yeah, it's, I mean, I've written law and regulation and just by the time I finished one and everyone's like two years back there looking at it and I'm, I'm looking at five years ahead going, oh, the non-fungible token stuff is like, it's so cool. But it's, again, it's, it's, 
it's such a it's such a quandrum of, of issues for regulators because we're not regulating stuff that we've always regulated and maybe we shouldn't you know but so I th that's the questions I don't understand hopefully you know in five years we've solved the problems with technology to actually maybe make regulation or in protocols but up until then it's it's sort of a, you know it's buy beware and um choose your own adventure yeah <laughs> You bring up some interesting points, one of which, um, so you mentioned that on the 27th of May, you're sitting in front of the heads of the Commonwealth. Um, what's your goal I there? To, what you... Sorry? I want to say, that I, I think we'll be Zooming. I don't think we'll be sitting together in the way that you know, the world is going. No, sure. um, but I want to say at Chogham, I say, you know, there's one, one thing that the Commonwealth does does do very well. And, and, and yeah, we do have a common law that we all unite together. So, you know, I think if, you know, I can't tell you the amount of countries, central bank governors, you know, I have some chats that call me the governor whisperer. I mean, I can't keep up with the amount of countries that I'm meant to be in and, you know, helping them with legislation and, and CBDCs. I'm like, oh my God. So for me, you know, now that there's a basic template, I guess, for legislation around digital assets, they're becoming more, um, they're becoming more institutionalized and they're not going away. I mean, three years ago, no one wanted to believe me because they thought they'd all just disappear into the, you know, the dark depths of where they came from and none of this stuff. Uh, enter Elon Musk and Tesla um, <laughs> and, you know, like, and Bitcoin going to $60,000. It's like, whoa. Um, so everybody needs to get to up to speed and, and a lot of places are not up to speed. They don't even know, you know what Bitcoin is. I, I speak to central banks and, you know, it's, it's a scary concept that the education piece of the people that are regulating this is so low compared to where the market is. And I also say, you know, I went to university, I finished in 1990. Everything I learned was in a book. You know, I'd go to a library and you'd get like some reference and you'd pull open a drawer and then you'd have to walk around, you know, aisles and aisles of bloody books to find the one you were looking for. The internet's changed all of that, but we still think the policymakers of the world are, you know, my age or older, we still think in those terms. So I keep saying to everybody, you know, talk to your children because you, your children know more about this stuff than you do. And we need to be writing policies for our kids and our kids' kids, not for ourselves, because this is the policies that we write are going to affect these next generations. It's not us. So don't look at it in your, you're going to retire in five years and you know, it won't be your problem. It will be a problem because it's going to be a problem for your kids and your kids. And the unintended consequences of writing bad regulation or ba banning things is so much worse than having good regulation or, or regulation that, that doesn't stifle innovation. Yeah. And look, you also mentioned NFTs there as well. What's your sort of thoughts around NFTs and, and where you sort of see that space going? Well, I've got a couple of thoughts. I, don't, I think I should NFT myself. I think that would. <laughs> I think that would be a good, a good use case. It's like, you know, so I can't be in so many places. Um, I think it's for the for, for NFTs are groovy. They're awesome, um, but I think at the, the amount of time. I mean, it's just, I'm going to say this very frankly. You got a lot of kids that have made a lot of money out of crypto into the dive. Guess what? If you're going into buying things like fine art and and you know you can NFT a piece of art, so you tax issue goes away. So I think there's a lot of that coming into it, to be absolutely really honest, where crypto money is going. Um, but I think, you know, where the, the way that NFTs are evolving, yeah, they're going to be they're going to be a great um, a, a spin off and a great use case. But I think at the moment, they've, everyone's a bit naughty. I think they're, they're using them for tax dodges, but are using, I don't quite me on that. Is there any regulation around NFTs at the moment, or is that sort of something oh, that? Oh God, no. That's no? Like every large organisation in the world is now coming. Going. We, yeah, I remember when I was talking about um, initial coin offerings and stable coins in, in twenty sixteen. Every regulator and big inter international institution like the IMF and the OECD were going, N -n -n -n, we don't need to worry about that. Now they're going, shit, we should have listened to you about the stable coin things. I mean, yeah, so everything has a flavour of the month. And nobody's up to speed. So no, the NFT, they're starting to doubt, new, doubt, you know, people are starting to do collaborative papers on what the hell it is and where's it going because the space is moving so quickly. You can't expect regulators um, to be ahead of the game. The best you can, you can expect is they, they are beyond par with technology. And, and you know, regulators have a lot of other stuff to do. They worry about digital assets, let me tell you. So you're a security regulator, you've got to do your normal daily, you know, 
whatever you do in your different asset class, you look after prudential regulators, you know, um, look after banks and stuff. Everybody's busy and now you just go and throw this whole new you know, technology on top of them and expect them to be up to speed in two years. It just, it doesn't happen. So, but, but yeah, the best that regulators can do is, is have a, a level playing field of their understanding. Yeah. Um, look, what are you sort of working on at the moment? I know you said you've just sort of finished literally writing some, some legislation about two hours ago. What sort of, I guess, plan for, I guess, the future and, um, and I guess what you're going to look at, look at me doing in the next couple of months? Um, well, I'm, I'm helping a lot of countries with their legislation as we speak. I'm working for a lot of African countries around, um, around their financial intelligence units, so on the AML TTF stuff, because it's one of the biggest issues we're finding. The FATF have put out recommendations, and one of the recommendations is Rec 15. So that talks about the beneficial owners of, of virtual assets, um, and you've got to know the beneficial owner. It also says that so. So countries, when they get assessed by the FATF, they, they do what they have to show the, what they call a national risk assessment. So that means that they, they've got to understand all the risks, you know, not only for virtual assets, where every industry, you know, whether it's the, the diamond dealers or where are the risks associated with money laundering, terrorism, financing across the entire economy. Now, those things are quite difficult, but now you know, come in and the, the FATF have said, you also have to give us a comprehensive um, view of your national risk assessment about what, what is happening with virtual assets in your jurisdiction. Now, that's, that takes, you know, that's not only law enforcement, that's the regulators, security regulators, that's the bank. So they all have to be working together to show that what they're doing to mitigate that risk. So I'm working at the moment with a number of African countries because everyone's got no idea. And so I don't do a lot of work with a company called Chain Analysis. And they are like the dog's bollocks, they're awesome. So you know, we can actually have the technology now that can show the movement of Bitcoin and where the nefarious transactions are coming in and out. And that's getting, um, I think, law enforcement and countries more comfortable because nobody wanted to come out with this regulation if they were gonna yeah, be hit on the head by the FATF. So I'm working on a lot of that. Um, I'm really interested and looking at a lot of the protocols, just from my own background, you know, how can I start to build you know, digital asset marketplaces that are just not crypto? You know, for me, the most exciting thing is how do I how do I um, digitalize assets that I've always traded, like you know, like the commodities, or you know, how do you digitalize gold and trade it? Um, all these different asset classes and new asset classes that we're going to see rise out of this this technology bubble, um, we haven't even thought about. So I, I'm really, I really like you know, the, the different aspects of how we can make illiquid assets, asset, um, the illiquid assets liquid. So look at gold. I lived in India for a long time. Everybody wears gold and at some standard, everyone goes, oh, it's worth a lot of money, but it's got a finite supply. It's very difficult to move. You've had like, it's like a house. It's very difficult to have, you need to liquidate it. Like, Makes no sense to me. So I think these, you know, the way that we can digitalize these assets that have been traditionally liquid and make them liquid is very exciting to me. So I'm gonna, I'm looking at projects like that. I my work is not done um, with governments getting them up to speed. I've been doing a lot of work around central bank digital currencies, looking at the different models, um, you know, and that to me is important as well because the unintended consequences of central banks controlling everything about a person like their money, um, I, I find it is, is going to be one of the biggest problems that we see for generations if we allow it. Because we know we can build these systems, these central bank digital currencies can be built, but you can't break the system. So what happens you know, unintendedly when bank controls everything? That's why I don't like the Chinese model because they're, they're building it to control people. We all live in democracies. None of us want that to happen. So we, we've got to be very careful um, when we're looking at CBDCs. It's not a one shoe fits all. So yeah, different governments have different requirements. You, know, you look at Australia, Canada, Canada yeah, 98 percent of our population are banked. So we really need it pretty much instantaneous. But I think yeah, CBDCs will work at a um, at a central bank level because yeah, with trade agreements and stuff and not having to trust anyone. So I think there's a, a level of corp, um, cooperation which can happen between different central banks um, and different countries have different needs. You know, where, where there's no financial inclusion and 98% of your population are not banked, there's a great use case. You know, if you could helicopter money into people, but not it's not one size fits all. And I think, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot and and it's interesting because 
Bob Kahn came up with an idea about a central bank digital currency in 1991. So this wow. is not new. And he, he had, and the, and the Federal Reserve told him to go and patent it. And he was like, all right. So, so you know, people have been looking at this for a really long time. Um, but the implementation of it is very difficult. Do you keep this, keep the commercial banks in it? You know, should, should the central bank be playing the role of a bank and lending? Like, no. So there's, you know, and there's different levels of understanding and different use cases for central bank digital currencies, which is, again, not uniform. So I've been working with a lot of central banks on that. Um, another piece of education, you know, they're, they're, everybody's grappling with the pace that this ecosystem is moving at. Yeah. And look, I know we've been gone for a little while and I know you've got another meeting to get to. Um, do you have any sort of closing thoughts or final thoughts that you can sort of share with us? And then also um, maybe just sort of tell us a little bit about where we can find out about, uh, obviously more about yourself and what you do. Um, so I have, I have two hashtags that I, I live by these. <laughs> um, collaboration is the new survival and we're all in this together because the, the walled garden approach of how we approach the internet didn't work. Silos don't work. Um, and the internet took many, many more years to get um, reputable because everybody wasn't working together. So nobody's got the answers. I mean, in the, none of us had the answers and you know, regulators don't have the answers. Policy writers don't have the answers and the industry certainly does ha doesn't have the answers. So we all need to work together much better. It, it, um, policy writers, you know, regulators and industry, we all need to get this right because it's not for me or my little girl's generation. These systems won't break. And the systems we're building in blockchain, they're not breakable. So if we're building them and yet we legislate stuff that's gonna be changed in five years, that's a problem. I, I, I did a LinkedIn post actually on International Women's Day and um, I got featured by the NASDAQ as a, a, a woman in fintech. And I, I, I think I was the Australian female leader once and then I was just the fintech leader. So we're, hopefully we're getting out of that, that gender bias. But I did this post about, um, about myself and, and yeah, where, where, where I thought women should sit. Um, and 60,000 people have viewed it. I would never have thought in wow. a million years that 60,000 people would. My daughter was embarrassed. She's like, mum, you're so embarrassing. You're not an influencer. I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not sitting in a cafe, a cafe sipping lattes and having photos on Instagram. So, so don't worry. But I think... <laughs> Um, we need more diversity, really. We need female coders because do if there's a bunch of you know 20, 30 year old dudes coding all this stuff, it's not going to work either. Like I'm female, I'm a mother. You know there needs to be much more gender diversity in this ecosystem. Please put women on your boards for God's sake because they bring in aspects that you don't even think about as a 26 year old you know, coder. So that. Um, please think about gender diversification. Um, encourage women to get in and, and code. Um, and yeah, and that's I've done quite a number of, of podcasts. I think I've, Binance put me on. Um, I, I seem to get asked a lot. So anything, I have a reference document actually. If anyone's interested, over the last seven years, I've collated probably what I would say is the best reference document list of all regulations of you know, how to do cold storage, hot, from Andreas Andropoulos to finance ministers. I'm happy to share that with everybody if they want it. So just send me a LinkedIn and I'll, I'll send it on. Because I think education to me is also very important because yeah, I think I'm the oldest person in blockchain, um, but it shouldn't be that way. you know. And, and I had to teach myself a hell of a lot um, um, you know, and I did. And I also have, so I have Bob Kahn as my mentor on the technology side. And I have a lovely man called Lord Megnum Desai, who is the chair of the LSE, who's now taught seven central bank governors sitting in office today. And I think he's taught about 19 others. He was sitting with Nixon the day they got rid of the gold standard. So when I walk into a room in a government or a central bank and I have Bob on one side, who's 84, and Lord Desai, who's 85, nobody argues with me. <laughs> Loretta, thank you so much. It's been a really great conversation. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Thank you. No, thanks for having me anytime. And I, yeah, this is the thing. We all need to learn together. Um, I can share any experiences that I, that I have. And I'm going to write a book soon called Dancing in the Devil with the Marigolds because, my God, <laughs> have I got some funny stories about this journey. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thanks for having me.